Welcome to the Making Sense Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Just a note to say that if you're hearing this, you are not currently on our subscriber feed and will only be hearing the first part of this conversation. In order to access full episodes of the Making Sense Podcast, you'll need to subscribe at samharris.org. There you'll find our private RSS feed to add to your favorite podcatcher, along with other subscriber-only content. We don't run ads on the podcast, and therefore it's made possible entirely through the support of our subscribers. So if you enjoy what we're doing here, please consider becoming one. Okay, just a brief housekeeping here. I hope you all enjoyed the beginning of the Oliver Berkman series on time management that uh, I previewed here in the last episode. Again, the rest of that will soon be appearing over at Waking Up in our new life section. And the whole point of this section is to bring relevant philosophy and science to bear on the question of how to live a good life. And that will include conversations between me and outside experts, but also courses designed by other people. And we have some interesting courses already in the works there. Also, I enjoyed the previous podcast with Peter Zion and Ian Bremer. That was a new format where I invited a subject matter expert to ride shotgun with me and help facilitate a conversation that was somewhat outside my wheelhouse. Perhaps I'll do more of that, or even begin moderating some debates here. I've thought about doing that for a while, and this seems like a good provocation in that direction. And also just a reminder that we launched the Best of Making Sense podcast, where we surface some of the evergreen episodes from previous years. I know many of you are enjoying that, but for those of you who haven't discovered it, it is a separate podcast where subscribers to Making Sense get full episodes, and otherwise we release half episodes in podcatchers everywhere. Okay, today I'm speaking with Mark Andreessen. Mark is a co-founder and general partner at the venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz. He is one of the few people to pioneer a whole software category used by more than a billion people, and one of the few to establish multiple billion-dollar companies. Mark co-created the first proper internet browser, Mosaic, which then became Netscape, uh, which he later sold to AOL for $4.2 billion. He also co-founded LoudCloud, which as Opsware was sold to Hewlett-Packard for $1.6 billion. Uh, He later served on the board of Hewlett-Packard from 2008 to 2018. Mark holds a degree in computer science from the University of Illinois, and he serves on the board of several Andreessen Horowitz portfolio companies, Applied Intuition, Carta, Dialpad, Honor, OpenGov, and Samsara Networks. And he is also on the board of Meta, otherwise known as Facebook. And in this episode, we cover a lot of ground. We talk about the current state of internet technology and culture, some of what has gone right, but there is much that is in the process of going wrong. We discuss Mark's background in tech, the birth of the internet, how advertising became the business model for digital media. We talk about the three stages of the web and the birth of blockchain, how successful technology reorders status and power in society, the uh, Bitcoin white paper, the mystery surrounding the identity of Satoshi Nakamoto, the importance of distributed consensus, Bitcoin as digital gold, how society has performed during COVID, James Burnham and managerial capitalism, the ubiquitous principal agent problem, negative externalities, risk and regulation, trust in institutions, what the fuck happened in 1971, regulatory capture, banning Trump and Alex Jones from social media, perverse incentives in philanthropy, and other topics. Anyway, I really enjoyed this conversation. Mark knows a lot about a lot, and uh, he is a very fast talker. I am a slow talker, so those of you who listen to this podcast on 2x are probably screwed for this one. Anyway, I now bring you Mark Andreessen.
I am here with Mark Andreessen. Mark, thanks for joining me. Hey, Sam. It's great to be here. So uh, we have a lot to talk about. You are a man of uh, many talents and uh, wide experience. And um, we haven't hung out much, but uh, I've spoken to you enough to get a uh, glimmer of your um, polymathic intentions, if not actual achievements. It's really, you see, you cover an incredible range of material in your, um, just in your, your information diet. And I, I want to get into to what you're most focused on and, and worried about these days. Sure. And I also want, I want to talk about your background a little bit, because people will know some of it, but I think in having you recapitulate a little, little bit of that journey into tech, you might be able to give us some insights as to what we should be thinking about now. But first, a high level, what do you, how do you describe yourself these days in terms of what you do professionally and what you focus on? Yeah, so my, my career has had kind of three stages so far. So you know, stage one was as an engineer, and I was I was trained as an engineer, and sort of that that sort of method <laughs> of engineering is kind of central to to, to everything, as it turns out that, that at least I, I do and think about. Then I became an entrepreneur, so I went into into business despite <laughs> having taken zero uh, business courses mm. and sort of went to the school of hard knocks. And so um, you know went into business and started uh, you know originally my first company with my partner Jim Clark in '94, and then my second company with Ben. Horowitz in 99 and then so forth and so on. And then, you know, phase three starting in 2009 was to become an investor, a professional investor, a venture capitalist. And so that's uh, phase three and then maybe some, someday one more phase, but uh, mm -hmm. the, at least those, those three have kept me busy so far. Oh, and then, you know, what, what we do, you know, so what does it mean to be a venture capitalist? You know, basically we're, a, think of it as like we're a hub that's the sort of center of flows of basically ideas, people, and money would be the mm -hmm. way to think about it. So we, you know, try to stay on the leading edge of all the new areas of technology. We try to know all the really smart people who are working on new technology and want to be part of the technology ecosystem. And then we, we raise, we raise, and then we actually raise money and we invest money. Um, and we, you know, we get very, we invest in startups. We get very deeply involved in the companies. We are typically on the board We're, you know, we're, we're very often the, the, the founders kind of, you know, main outside confidant mm -hmm. advisor, you know, we, 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 you know, we get the call when things go horribly wrong and, you know, try to pitch in and help. And, you know, and then try to maximize the success for the companies that, you know, that kind of hit, hit a chord. Yeah. And how would you describe your politics at this point? <laughs> so I would say mostly I'm sort of, uh, you know, on an ice flow all by myself, headed slowly out to sea. Hmm. Um, well, I, I think there's a few people on that flow with you. <laughs> That's prob probably or at least on nearby flows. Uh, drifting together and apart. So I, 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 this is, you know, I, I could go on at length about this. I, I, I was always kind of a centrist Democrat, like basically everybody else I knew in, mm -hmm. in tech and in the Valley. You know, the, the Valley is like, you know, 99%. You know, the, you know, the picture always gets painted, the Valley is a bunch of radical libertarians or something. And in reality, it's just like 99%, basically Clinton Democrats. And now, you know, kind of whatever, <laughs> Warren Democrats, Bernie Democrats. And so, you know, I, I was always that up until like call it 2015, 2016. And then like everybody else, I was just completely shocked by really by two things. One was Trump winning, you know, both the nomination and the election, and then also just the, the huge shift on the left, yeah. you know, that, 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 that took place. And so I, I kind of checked out of traditional politics in 2015 and kind of went on a spirit walk and decided to try to kind of reread everything from scratch and figure out what was going on. And I've kind of come out the other side in sort of a weird, fuzzy, undefined <laughs> state. So I don't, I don't even know that I even apply any labels. Mm. Uh, you know, I'm not doing anything politically. I'm, I'm, I'm completely out of it. So um, I'm, I'm mostly just trying to learn and understand at this point more, more than like have positions. Yeah. Well, that describes my own political identity pretty well at this moment. Perhaps we'll get back to that. I, I think, I don't think we'll focus on politics, but the political context will inform much of what we say about the breakdown and, and rebuilding or failures of rebuilding. Uh, around institutions and solving the massive coordination problem of how, how do we get strangers who don't trust themselves all that much or trust one another all that much to collaborate. But uh, before we talk about your background earlier, again, high level, what would you say have been a few of the, the influences or life experiences that you currently consider most formative of your worldview on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, I think, you know, look, part of it was growing up in the sort of, you know, Midwest. I, I used to think I traveled sort of this weird road from like rural agricultural Midwest all the way to kind of high tech Silicon Valley. And it was kind of, you know, an unusual thing. And then I, I discovered years later, I discovered Tom Wolfe, the great American, you know, novelist reporter, wrote a long form profile of a guy named Robert Noyce, 
who was basically the inventor of the microchip mm -hmm. um, and the creator of you know Intel, and the, basically the creator of, of the tech industry as we know it today. And he wrote this profile of, of Bob Noyce, and Bob Noyce basically was like an Iowa farm farm boy, you know, who grew up in like rural Iowa and then moved to um, you know moved to the valley and sort of created <laughs> created the valley, created technology as we know it today. And so it's and then you know Wolf also pointed out like that's the story of like Philo Farnsworth who created television, and you know and many others. And so there's there's like you know. I always describe the, the valley is like this intersection of like 1950s style Midwestern tinkerer, engineer, you know, the, the guys with like the brush cuts and the white short sleeve polyester shirts, mm -hmm. you know, like you see in all the old photos of NASA or something. It's, it's kind of got that kind of square culture, engineering kind of nerd culture. And then it's got the kind of 1960s California counterculture, you know, which is because it, it happened here. And so that, that, that stuff all kind of threaded into it. And it's, it's, it's like it's like balanced on a knife's edge between those two cultures. And so I, I definitely, you know, kind of come out of that of that kind of former background. So yeah, I mean, going from, you know, there to here, you know, was, was, was very important, you know, like partnering with my, you know, my business partner, Jim Clark was, you know, a very successful entrepreneur, you know, what had, had, was the founder of one of the most successful companies in the history of the industry. And I, I kind of got lucky and that I got to work with him at a time when he wanted to start a new company and all the smart people he knew were kind of working at his current company. So he had to go get fresh blood and I happened, <laughs> I happened to be newly arrived. And so, you know, we kind of, we kind of hooked up and built, built our company Netscape. That was formative. Uh, the dot com crash <laughs> was a very formative experience. Mm. You know, we hit that really hard, and then you know, look, the last you know the last twenty years, you know, the fact the internet didn't die after two thousand, and like there was like a whole second tech boom, and then you know everything kind of magically coming together starting in two thousand seven or two thousand eight between the iPhone and broadband and social networking and everything else that created the world we're in today. You know, all, all this stuff at this point has worked you know way beyond any expectation any of us could have possibly had. So, you know, kind of kind of seeing that all crystallize and come together you know, has really, really, really taught me a lot. And then of course, you know, now we're in whatever weird state we're in today. Yeah. That, that's kind of how I got here. So and what was your academic background before you became an internet pioneer? Well, you, you did a CS degree? Yeah. So I was a classic Midwestern kind of story, which is of course, you know, the purpose of a college education is to make money. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> none, of this, none of this airy right. fairy stuff. And so I went to the U.S. News and World Report issue in, I think, 1988. And I looked up the uh, in income levels by a bachelor's degree. Uh, and of course, the top degree was electrical engineering at that time. And so, and then I looked for the top double E schools and the number three school was uh, University of Illinois, which was right across the border. So, you know, that, that made those two decisions easy. I got in school and then discovered I hugely preferred software, which I should have known because I was always coding as a kid, but mm -hmm. I just software, there's just, you know, double E's are, you know, tremendously important and have, have done a lot to build the modern world, but software, there's a level of creativity that's just hard to do in Adams. And so, uh, you know, I kind of got seduced by software and then got a computer science degree. And so let, let, let's talk through what happened with Mosaic and, and Netscape for a few minutes. I mean, but most people will associate your name with Netscape, but it was Mosaic first, right? I mean, you, you started this yeah. company and um, what, what was the name change about? What happened there? Well, it didn't start as a company. And so it started as a, as a project. It started as a project at the University of Illinois. Mm. And so it started as a federally funded research project at, at what was at the time, at the time called the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, which the, the, the sort of short version is, remember when Al Gore said that he invented the internet? Yeah. It, it turns out that story is actually largely true <laughs> in the sense of what he actually said was, you know, the full quote was, I took the lead in creating the internet in the Senate. And that, that story actually is true, which is mm -hmm. in the Senate, the US Senate in the mid 1980s, funded two things that ended up being very important for my career. One was they funded the internet backbone, the, what was called at the time NSFNet after the National Science Foundation. And then they funded what were called the, the four national supercomputing centers. When, and one of those just happened to be at the University of Illinois. The significance of that was basically they just dropped like a ton of money on, on these, four, these four universities, including Illinois, to basically buy state-of-the-art computers and then hook them up to the, the internet. And you know this is starting in the mid-80s. And so by the, way, by the time I got there in 89, this was kind of underway. And so we, we, we had, in retrospect, basically a modern computing, internet, networking, broadband, graphical environment, just you know, basically five, 10 years before the rest of the world. So you, you could kind of see it working. Was that pure serendipity? Or did you actually know going to Illinois that you were going to have access to unusual computer resources? Well, they were, you know, like I said, they were number three ranked for double E nationally. It was like mm -hmm. MIT, Stanford, and then University of Illinois. So that reflected that. They were top 10 CS at the time. So they, they were, no, I mean, they were by far the best engineering school in the Midwest at that point. Um, and it was just too much of a leap at that point in my life to go to the East Coast or the West Coast. So, right. so it, 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 the reason they ranked so high is because they were so central. Like they had, they had the, you know, they had these very advanced programs and all these resources. And so, you know, I had a glimmer of it. I knew about it. But, you know, I, I didn't fully understand the important until I got there and I saw it. 
Right. And then basically, and what happened was NSF basically just like funded this essentially to build the modern internet at, at the time as, as a research, as a research, you know, something for scientists at the time. This is back in the days there was actually, um, it was actually illegal to do business on the internet during this period, right? There was a, <laughs> something called the, the acceptable use policy that basically banned all commercial transactions. So, so it was purely a research thing. Nobody really envisioned it having real world applications at that time. It was just kind of for scientists and academics. But, you know, there was a research group there that had the job of basically writing software to make the internet work for, you know, people. Mm. And we basically had a project that started as kind of a renegade project that became an official project that was this thing called Mosaic, which was the first browser that kind of got widely used. It kind of pulled in all the functions, made everything graphical, and then made it work really well and fast and secure and so forth. And then everybody started using that on the internet as it then existed. Uh, right. And that was basically, that was when I was making $6.25 an hour. Mm. Yeah, well, I hope you invested that wisely because I'm told compounding really works. <laughs> well, <laughs> until recently. Yes, right. Until, until, until it's right, yeah, back until, back. yeah, until the last two months. So yes. then you formed a proper company, Netscape, and yeah. what happened? What, why, what happened to Netscape as a product? Yeah, well, so first of all, it was very, it was very tenuous that we ever even started that company because it was, it was so... There was such a wall of negativity. It was so universally known that the internet was not something that ordinary people would ever use, right? And it, and the, if you read the newspapers and magazines at the time, mm. they were just wall to wall. When they wrote about the internet, it was primarily either as an object of curiosity that would never matter or, or negatively of this thing's never going to matter. What year are we now? 93, 94. 93, right, right. Okay. Yeah, kind of 92, 93, 94. The, the first issue of Wired Magazine, I, I bought the first issue of Wired Magazine off the newsstand in, I think, 90, early 93 when I was working on Mosaic uh, or late 92. And it, I remember uh, bought it like four in the morning, going to make, do, a, do, a, uh, mm -hmm. do a snack run. And I saw this thing on the newsstand and I, you know, I was excited, finally a magazine for me. And I went back to my office and read it from front to back and it didn't even mention, mention the internet, right? And I was like, <laughs> okay, I guess, <laughs> I guess I'm on the wrong end of this whole thing. So, and, and, and it's not that Wired got anything wrong. It's just that that was universally the view. And all the experts said that and all the big company CEOs said that. It's just, this is not, a, this is not gonna be a thing. So. What was motivating you at that point? Did you actually believe that everyone was wrong and realize that the internet was going to be a way to not only get rich, but just basically do more or less everything that was going to prove indispensable in the future? Or were you just tinkering and, and following your interests without any big picture vision? So it was actually a process of elimination, which is we kind of tried everything else instead. Mm. <laughs> basically concluded that, nope, it was just going to be the internet. And so uh, my partner, Jim, and I actually had other business plans that we kind of cycled through trying to do, inter at the time, interactive television was this big idea. And then we, we tried to do, we had a plan for an online gaming network that's sort of like what Xbox Live today is today. We basically worked through all these other ideas for kind of advanced, you know, AOL at that point was starting to work a little bit. So it's like, mm -hmm. what would it mean to do one of those, like a proprietary consumer service? And we, we, we kind of kept, you know, just we, we had the startup mentality of like, okay, well, let's from scratch make a business plan for building a company that does anything like this. And, and basically we cycled through all the other ideas and, and, and then, you know, in the background kind of mosaic kind of kept growing, right? It, it kept going after I left Illinois and, you know, more, and more people were using it. And it was just like, you know, I was, and I still had my, you know, I had my email login. And so I, I had the, <laughs> I had the, I had, um, I had the account. Mosaic was, was free for academic use. But it had a, we put a provision in the license that said you have to pay for commercial use. And we just did that as a placeholder because we didn't have a business model at Illinois. But I had the email box. I had the email box where people would send in commercial inquiries where they would want to do something, you know, in the commercial sector with it, like e-commerce or whatever. And so, you know, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these like messages coming in from people who wanted to do crazy, crazy things like I want to build a bookstore on the Internet. Like, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, yeah, <laughs> so, lose my email, Jeff. Yeah, exactly. Well, actually, pre-Jeff, pre right? Pre-Jeff, yeah. you know, even, even before that. And so, yeah, so I just like, at some point, Jim and I literally looked at each other and we're like, okay, th this internet thing might actually be the thing. Like maybe all these other experts are just wrong. Maybe this actually is the correct thing. And, it, you know, I look, the internet had all kinds of problems and issues that I could take you through. It has a long litany of, you know, people had all these complaints about it that were correct. It's not secure and you can't do transactions and blah, 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 blah. Mm. And it's not fast, right? And it's just like, well, you know, look, if the network effect really takes and lots of people sign up to use this and lots of businesses come online, then it's going to drive an investment wave that's going to solve all these other problems, which is basically what happened. And so we, we, we kind of did what in retrospect was the obvious decision, which is we just leaned in hard on that. Right. And how did the business model get anchored to ads? Because of all the things oh. that could have gone differently in the beginning, um, and maybe the tech wasn't there, you just said there, there, was, there was no way to pay for things, but it seems like that could have been an early priority. And I'm not sure you entirely share my my view of just how diabolical 
the ad-based economy has been in the end. But I wonder what what was that moment like where you just slap a banner ad on it and that's how you you monetize the future of digital media. Yeah, so it's because we had no we had no native money, right? We had no native ability to do money. We had no way to do microtransactions. We knew this at the time. So we, we knew right up front, we were like, look, there needs to be a way to send and receive money. There needs to be a way to do e-commerce. There needs to be a way to do microtransactions. We knew this at the time. There were two kind of big things, and we were in a position to do it because we had, the, we had the, the browser, but we also had the servers and the e-commerce software and all the back, the back end stuff. And so mm -hmm. we were in a position to, to do all this. So we figured there were two parts to the problem. Part one was cryptography, right? So basically security, right? So to be able to have like secure, you know, secure communication. And we invented this protocol called SSL for secure cryptography. It's the it's the first widely used kind of delivery of, of, of the science of cryptography to consumers, you know, sort of happened as a, a consequence of the Netscape browser and, and, and SSL. And, and that's, by the way, that's still in use. SSL is still the right. encryption method for the internet today. So, so that part worked. And then the other part was like, okay, you need to plug into the existing banking system, right? And you need to be able to plug in so people can load, you know, have their credit card, their debit card, their bank account, their checking account, because they've got all their money somewhere and they've got to be able to, you know, kind of get it to the internet. And so for that, we went and we started talking to all the big banks and the big credit card companies. And, you know, we got, again, this sort of wall of skepticism. And everybody kind of told us basically, <laughs> basically F off. This is never going to work. And then we got our big meeting that kind of really hammered this home for me. We, we, we found this guy at uh, just, I guess I shouldn't name names specifically, but one of the very big credit card companies, let's mm -hmm. say. Uh, there was a CTO who was like considered, we, we were told he was like the visionary for the payments industry and the guy that everybody listened to. And it's like, if you can get him on your side, you know, you can really do something here. So we had him to our office. He had not used the internet or Mosaic or Netscape at that point. So we sat him down in front of a workstation, you know, with a keyboard and a mouse and a big screen and, you know, had it all queued up for the demo and said, you know, and I, and I basically pointed on the, uh, you know, the, the, the first link on the screen. And I said, you know, click here. And so, of course, he reaches up with his finger and touches the screen. <laughs> um, and this is, you know, 1994, right. right? So there's no touch screens. Yeah. So nothing happens. Um, and then I'm like, no, no, you use the mouse. And so then, of course, he looks at the mouse and then, of course, he picks it up. Hmm. Right. And so, you know, and, you know why, why, how could that possibly be the case? Well, because the, the entire banking payments industry at that point was on mainframes from 30 years earlier. Right. They, you know, they didn't do new things. <laughs> That's not what they were in business to do. And so I, I remember in that meeting, you know, it's just like, okay, this is it. We're sunk. There's no way this can happen. So, so, you know, we tried, Microsoft tried, other people tried, AOL tried, and it's just, there was never any way to do it. And so, you know, if you can't charge people for things then you got to run ads and that basically is what happened. Hmm. Let's maybe give us a, a short primer on, on the stages of development here. We have web one, web two, and web three. I'm imagining you envision web three as ushering a, a new age of monetizing everything potentially in a secure, trustless way. Right. So let's climb there. What, what do we mean by web one, two, and three at this point? Sure. So my partner, Chris Dixon, has sort of the best encapsulation of this. He says, web one was read, right? And so the, right, the big breakthrough was you go online, you could read stuff, you could see stuff, you could do searches, you could do all this, but you were like, you know, you could consume. Web two was what he calls read write, right? So, and that's sort of the social networking, blogging, video, YouTube, you know, kind of user generated content era, right? So, not only could you read, you could do what you do. You could, you could, uh, you know, not only listen, you could produce podcasts, and that that led to the, you know, kind of the whole the world that we've been in. And then he says, Web three is read write and own, right? And and own means you can own value, right? You can own money, you can own digital assets, right? You can own, you know, you can you can have ownership claims on things. Right. Or, you, or, you, or, you know, you could equivalently, you could say read, write, pay. You could say read, write, you know, make money. You know, you could apply whatever term you want to that, that third one. But basically, you basically fill in all of the economics and all of the capability of having incentives and ownership that really should have been there from the start. That, like I said, you know, we tried to get in from the start, but we just didn't have the technology for. Now we basically have a chance with these new technologies of blockchain, cryptocurrency, Web3. You know, we have this we have basically, we, we think a chance to kind of do the other half of the internet is mm. how I think about it, uh, or the, you know, the other third. And it's basically have a trust layer, a money layer, and an ownership layer that rides on top of the sort of untrusted, unowned, you know, kind of space that's been the internet so far. And then kind of, you know, fill in all the things that we wish we'd been able to do from the start, but, but now we can actually do. Uh, I wouldn't be alone in noticing that there's a fair amount of skepticism about Web3 at this point, and a fair amount of schadenfreude watching cryptocurrency crash or almost crash in recent months. Do you view that skepticism as truly analogous to all of the naysayers around Web 1 when they thought the internet was just going to be 
a bust and that no one was ever going to migrate away from you know their answering machine. Even this email thing wasn't going to take off. Or do you think there is a greater foundation for a perception of uh, misspent dreams and failures of scaling the technology? I mean, around the, the energy concerns, the cost of it all, the capacity for fraud, the tulip mania aspect of the kind of the investing landscape or the speculation landscape there. How much of this is an echo of the, the early 90s and how much of this is a, a genuinely new condition of uncertainty? Yeah, so there's a lot in there and we can, you know, we can go through each of those points. Hmm. Here's the big thing I'd say overall. Look, a lot of things just don't work, right? So a lot of people have ideas for things that don't work. And so, you know, it's always possible that the critics are correct. And it's always possible something either is just never going to work. Or, or the other possibility is things are just too early, right? What happens with a lot of new technologies is they just take time. Hmm. You know, there were people doing analog, there were people doing mechanical television 30 years before Philo Farnsworth did electronic television. <laughs> they did mechanical television like the 1880s, 1890s with like spinning wooden blocks representing <laughs> pixels. Right, right, right. And so there's this prehistory, you know, it's like, uh, what was it? Paris had a telegraph system working through uh, flashes of light through uh, long glass tubes under the streets of Paris in like the 1830s, right? Which was not right. practical, right? Because the tubes kept breaking, but like, pe you know, people had that idea way before the telegraph rolled out. So, so anyway, you know, look, for any new technology, maybe you're just early, maybe you're just wrong altogether, maybe it doesn't happen. For the new technologies that do work, you see basically a pattern of the reaction to them. Um, and I used to kind of think I was make, I was kind of fantasizing this. And then I, I found a book that kind of explained it. It's this book by this MIT guy named Elting Morrison 50 years ago, where he kind of goes through, this is even pre-internet, but he goes through the whole history of new technologies. And he said, there's basically a three-stage process to the adoption of any new technology. Stage one is just ignore, right? Where basically just people pretend it doesn't even exist. And of course that's, you know, the internet was ignored basically from mm -hmm. the 1960s through to the, like I said, kind of even, even, into, the, even into the early 90s. Stage two is basically vigorous protest. And that's the stage where basically it's like, a, it's like basically here are the 30 reasons this can never happen. Or, or call it the, the reasons phase, right? So here's the 30 reasons this can never happen. And usually what that is, 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 is a laundry list of everything that's technically wrong with new technology, right? So the internet, it was, it's too slow and it's not graphical and it's this and it's insecure and the hackers and, you know, fraud and, you know, all, mm -hmm. this, all these sort of, you know, basically facts. By the way, real issues, right? These are all issues that actually had to get fixed and, and then ultimately were fixed. And then he said, stage three, stage three in the book, he says, is when the name calling begins. Mm -hmm. And so stage three is basically rage. And what he basically says is, 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 it's basically rage. It's basically the existing power structures basically just like go incandescent with rage. And, and he said, the reason for that is because any new technology that works is a reordering of status and power, right, in, in the system. And basically the, you know, the status quo is, you know, what do they hate more than anything else? You know, reordering of status and power, right? There's only mm -hmm. downside for them. And so they just go crazy. And that's when they pull out all the stops and they call you names and they try to put you in jail and you know, they do everything under the sun they can possibly do to sabotage it. And then, you know, and then look, it, it has to prove itself, right? It has to, you know, to get through those three gauntlets, like it has to be a real thing. So, so like I said, it's not predictive that because something goes through this, it is going to work. It's just that every single time something yeah. works like this, it goes through these stages. And so at, at this point, like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like inured to it. Right. Like it's just, I've seen it now so many times uh, in the exact same sequence of, of, of things that I'm just like, okay, fine, you know, bring it. This is mm -hmm. what they're going to do. We're just going to keep going. But what percentage of your time and commitment of resources at this point is focused on Web3? I, I mean, we might actually need to, I, I know I've done this on other podcasts, but we probably should define Web3 a little bit more, just differentiating, you know, cryptocurrency from everything else that could be done on the blockchain. But, um, sure. You can do that, but, it, but then how much of your attention and, and material resources are, are aimed at that at the moment? Yeah, it's, look, it's a very big push for us. So we have a very big group in the space now. It's probably a third of, I would say, you know, you could, you could top line it and say maybe a third of the firm in terms mm -hmm. of a combination of people and money. Right. Which right. for us, is, it's, one of our big, it's, one of our biggest, it's one of our biggest things. Okay, so, so give me the potted definition of Web3 at the moment. Yeah, so let's take the three terms that we kind of, again, kind of conjoin. So, so blockchain is like the underlying technological breakthrough. So, so basically what happened was this, 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 this person, he, she, it, or they, mm -hmm. named Satoshi Nakamoto, ne never identified. Well, are you swearing that this is not you? It yeah. is definitely not oh, me. Okay. Although if it was, that's exactly what I would be saying. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but still, I trust you somehow in, the, in this trustless environment. Well, say, you know, same is true for you. If it was you, you'd be asking, you'd be pretending to ask me the question without knowing too. So I think it does stand a better chance of being you given our, <laughs> our different backgrounds. But, um, do you have any suspicions about who it is or whether it's a, a single individual? 
Yeah, there are suspicion. Most of the people in the space think it, it was a combination of people. It, it, it was a it was a deep technological breakthrough, and it built on you know it was one of these things that built on thirty years of prior work. It's against one of these things that had kind of a long wind up before mm -hmm. before it happened. And so it was somebody, and he he she it or they posted a lot on forums, and you can read all the posts as it was in development. So you can kind of see whoever it was had like a very deep knowledge in the space, and that that kind of reduces it down to a pretty small number of candidates just given the, the nature of the technology at that time. So it was probably, people think it was a handful of those people probably working together. This is the Bitcoin yeah. white paper, uh, which, yeah. when is this, 2010, 9? 2009, 9. 2009. Well, by the way, profoundly significant, by the way, just profoundly significant, this gets missed. 2009 was the low of the economy and the stock market and everything else and the high of unemployment following the financial crisis, mm -hmm. right? So it was the last year you would expect a major new break. Like everybody was in a horrible mood in 2009. I remember it very clearly because we started the firm then and everybody was like uniformly negative that you could start a new venture capital firm. And so in the middle of just like complete misery, and by the way, in the middle of like the collapse of the prior financial system, right? The, the sort of what we call the trad financial system, mm. right? Just being like completely trash and discredited and falling apart and having to be bailed out, right? This like magic thing happens. This paper comes out and it just like, re, you know, basically redefines the industry. It, it was a very special moment. Did you see its significance immediately? No, I didn't. No, I, no, I wouldn't claim that. You know, it, it was something kind of people knew about. Everybody read it. People talked about it a lot. It, it was like a parlor game in Silicon Valley for the first five years or so. Which is, it's like, you know, e like even in Silicon Valley, right? It's like, okay, this probably is not going to be a thing. Like really mm -hmm. internet money, you know, geez, right? Like all the reasons why, you, you know, you sh shouldn't be able to do that, can't do that, it won't work. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the Silicon Valley parlor game of that is less maybe for, you know, some people had foresight and saw it, but a lot of people didn't. And a lot of us were like, wow, but wouldn't it be cool if it did, right? And so then the parlor game was like, wow, like, you know, what if, you know, we always have the joke, it's like on Earth 2, right? You know, this stuff is all working, right? And it's like, well, what would Earth 2 be like if it really had Bitcoin everywhere? And it's like, wow, this is a really cool idea. And then at some point, you know, we, we and others were just like, okay, like we need to stop being idiots here and basically just be like, yeah, this is actually a thing. This is actually going to happen. This stands a very good chance of actually happening. Mm. Our, our, our credit, our partner, Balaji Srinivasan, you know, was the guy who kind of got us really clued in on this and, you know, kind of sat us down at one point. It's like, look, you guys have to stop thinking about this as hypothetical, like this thing is actually happening. And so, you know, we were early relative to the world, but there were other people in the Valley who were ahead of us. Mm. And is there a um, kind of an initial cache of Bitcoin that has not been claimed, which is Satoshi's coin, or is there an initial wallet that has, is, still has the coin sitting in it? Or what, what's the, the story there? Yes, yeah, so this is part of the great kind of <laughs> mythic legend behind the whole thing. So, you know, all of Bitcoin is basically based on this underlying science of cryptography, right? Which is a, you know, it's an ancient science, but in its modern form, you know, it's a 50, 60 year old kind of thing in terms of the, the way we use the technologies now, the so-called public key cryptography. And so it's, it's all based on that. And as part of that, you can have what are called private keys that are uniquely yours. And as part of that, you can sign messages with your private key and, and such that anybody in the world can decode them or read them, but only you could have written them. Right, so you, you mm. can have like absolute validation that you were the you were the right you were the creator, um, and then the the and then Bitcoin wallets basically work the same way. Like you have a private key for the wallet, and anybody who has the private key can decrypt it. Right, it's like a bearer instrument in that way. But anybody who doesn't have the private key, like can't you know they have no claim to it. And so and very, you know along the over the years, various people show up and claim to be Satoshi, but like none of them can like demonstrate that they have the private key. None of them can you know so therefore you have nothing. So anyway, we sort of know, we know how to recognize Satoshi when we see <laughs> she, mm. it or they, which is they can use their private key to sign things. They could also use their private key to unlock the money. I don't know what the current value is. I'm in a guess it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to $50 billion US dollars today right, right. that is sitting in a wallet somewhere that the Satoshi key unlocks. That money has never been touched. But that, that's an extraordinary fact if, yes. if it's a single individual or a, a group of people. I mean, this is... Even without that, this is one of the best kept secrets ever. Yes. But when you look at the treasure Sierra Madre incentives that that uh, are growing with that kind of wealth locked up in a box, how do you explain that? This is just this, this person is ideologically so pure and enamored of the brilliance of this founding myth and moment that they're just they're not tempted to suddenly own fifty billion dollars. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, so this is the amazing thing. The fact that money was not claimed for a long time, right? And by the way, the message has stopped after the Bitcoin white paper came out, Satoshi stopped posting mm. in public. And so, and, and by the way, you have to pause for a second here to say how, 
prescient must this person have been to not only develop this thing and write it and create it after basically 30 years of people trying to do the same thing, by the way, like this, this was the breakthrough. How prescient was he, she, it, or they that not only did they get the technology right, but also they knew ahead of time that they needed to stay anonymous, mm -hmm. right? Like that's not normal. Like it's not, like I've never been anonymous. Like it's not normal in our industry to be anonymous. Yeah. And so whoever it is had like tremendous, tremendous foresight to, 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 to know to do that. And then, yeah, to not claim the money. So the, the prevailing view for a long time was he, she, it, or they are dead, right? right? Which is the most, most obvious thing. And, and you know, there, there is at least one candidate for Satoshi who did pass away. So, you know, it, 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 it's, it's certainly possible that's the case. It's also possible, by the way, something very embarrassing happened. It's possible he, she, it, or they lost for, their Forgot key. their key, yeah. <laughs> forgot yeah. their key, which would be embarrassing. Yeah. The kind of thing that might torture you for a long time. And then this weird thing happened. I don't know if you remember, there was Newsweek magazine did this cover story claiming that they had uncovered Satoshi Nakamoto. Mm, and no. they, 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 okay, so uh, this is several years ago now. This huge uh, Newsweek cover story, and they said, we found Satoshi. And they identified an older gentleman who is a Japanese American named Dorian Nakamoto, who is like an aerospace engineer or something in like, I forget, so Southern California somewhere, like, I don't want to say San Diego or Orange County. And they did this entire expose about he's the guy. And the whole time he's like, I'm not the guy, I'm not the guy, I'm not the guy, I'm not the guy. And they're like, yes, you are. And, and you know, in the, in the CS community, like we're all like, well, he's not a computer scientist. He's not, he's a, he seems like he's like a smart engineer, but he doesn't have this background. Like this seems weird. So anyway, there was one final message signed by Satoshi's private key that came out at that point, And it literally was, I am not Dorian Nakamoto. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and then Satoshi has since gone quiet. And so now we're, we're back, we're back to the great mystery, which, you know, I, I hope, we'll, you know, I don't know. I don't know, actually, I don't know if I hope it gets solved. I would, you know, the engineer in me would like to know, but you know, it may be better for, you know, I think the world should have some mystery to it. And if this is the fundamental breakthrough that sort of is a division in, you know, before and after in civilization, we never find out who the person was that I think there's something romantic about that. So yeah, I, no, I kind of hope we never find out. It's a great story. So I derailed you. You did not yet differentiate Bitcoin from all else that can happen on the blockchain. So blockchain is the under, so basically the white paper basically came out, the Bitcoin white paper, it's very short, people can read it. And basically, um, the, uh, basically it says we have this, basically a data structure called the blockchain, which is a way to do a decentralized permissionless, basically data structure that everybody agrees on, which we could talk about sort of, it's sort of a way to do a, a database, but a, in a database that kind of is spread out across the internet, we call that the blockchain, it's literally a chain of blocks. And then, so, the, and, and the, the computer science term is distributed consensus. And so that's, if you read the computer science literature like that, that's the thing that was solved. That's the technology breakthrough, like the, you know, the, the cold fusion or whatever of, of the thing. And then basically said, there's an, there's sort of an immediate and obvious use case for this, which is digital money. Because if I have a, if I have a, basically a, a database, an internet wide database that records, you know, debits and credits or records ownership of assets, then basically I could just basically, those slots can represent money. Uh, they can represent value. And if you own the slot today, you own the money. And if I own the slot tomorrow, you know, I own the money and, 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 and there it goes. And, and, and it's this giant, it's this way to get agreement. So it's a distributed consensus. It's a way to get consensus of who owns what across the entire internet. And, 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 and actually what happens, and this is a, a, a subtle point, is the use case of the capability of doing digital money is sort of an artifact. It's, it's sort of a natural consequence of having this kind of database. Mm -hmm. and, and then by the way, it turns out you also, you, you also want a form of digital money to make a blockchain work because you need to pay the miners, right? And so the, the, the way the blockchain works is people run the code on their, on their computers and you know, that costs them some amount of money, primarily in the form of power. You know, they gotta, well, they got to buy the computers and they got to power the computers and store them somewhere. And so the way the miners get paid is with the currency that sort of emerges from the system. So you've got the, you've got the blockchain, which is sort of the infrastructure, and then you've got this like use case, artifact, spinoff, emergent thing, which is kind of this, you know, the coin, the, the, the currency that comes out the other end. That was that original pairing. And then Im immediately upon that release, people started to say, okay, that's great. And, and you know, the, 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 the true believers right up front were like, okay, that's great. That's obviously going to happen. And, th and then they basically, right from the beginning, they started saying, okay, what else could you do with the blockchain? And that leads to all these other use cases that people are talking about now. And that's what we call Web3. So we, we, we use the term Web3 for all of the basically use cases uh, of the blockchain, which includes digital money, but the other, you know, 100 ideas that people are pursuing today. Right, right. And, and how much of your investment and, and bullishness with respect to Web3 is predicated on the expectation that Bitcoin will endure, Bitcoin specifically as a, if not the only cryptocurrency uh, and store of value, the, uh, a major one. Yeah, so Bitcoin's really unusual. It, it, and it goes back to uh, you know, this original kind of founding you know, myth reality, which is very unusual, which is it's not changing. 
right? And so, and, and if you just think about technology, like we, we have this adage in, in the Valley, it's like te technology is like bananas. Like, it, like it goes, it, new technology becomes obsolete almost immediately, mm. right? Like I, I ship and, you know, you see this all the time now, I ship a new whatever, this, that, video game player, whatever. It's like, you know, a year later, it's like, you know, it's last year's news. It's the previous iPhone model, right? And, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's the great, you know, glory of the tech industry. It's like, we keep pushing this stuff forward. We keep, it keeps doing new things. And so, you know, we, there's a museum in San Jose called the, you know, the museum of whatever computer museum, computer history museum. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's fun to go to, but it's, it's, you know, every single thing in it is something nobody uses anymore Yeah. because they're all obsolete. And so any other area of technology, you'd say, you know, Bitcoin comes out, the founder vanishes, it doesn't change. It's essentially unchanged, you know, they made a little tinkering around it, but it's essentially unchanged since 2009. It's now 13 years old. It's obviously going to be completely obsolete. And by the way, Lots of other people have developed lots of new blockchains and lots of new forms of cryptocurrency and lots of new Web3 things and so forth along the way. And so shouldn't it just kind of fade away? You know, so, you know we, we honor it as the forerunner of what we have, but we're, we're building better systems now. <laughs> the thing that's so unusual about it and, and, uh, on this topic is that it, it, it is digital gold, right? And so it, 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 it's, it's sort of one and only like real foundational fundamental use case of store of value. And, and basically it's like, okay, it's digital gold. And so like, what would you, if you were going to basically write a spec for digital gold, what would you say would be the main thing you would need from it? And the main thing you would need from it is that it doesn't change. Right. Right. So this is like the one application of technology I've ever seen where it's actually a benefit, right? It's a part of the bull case for it, that it doesn't change. In particular, because, it, it, the amount of it doesn't change. You're not going to find much more of it suddenly. Yeah, that's right. The amount, the amount of it is fixed. The amount of it is fixed. But, but even more than that, it's like, Bitcoin 10 years, it's the only thing I know of where 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 100 years from now, it's going to be running essentially the same way that it runs today. Hmm. And it's just it's literally because like Satoshi's not here to change it and nobody else is going to change it. And like, it's, it's just, it's, it's on his track. And so, but it's, if it's, if it's literally digital gold, if it's like a permanent store of value, then all of a sudden you've taken what historically be a weakness, turned it into a strength. So, so, so my, my best guess would be that Bitcoin is sort of the digital gold. My best guess, though, also would be that it's, it's, it's new systems being developed today or over the next, you know, 10 years, you know, that will basically take all the other use cases. And, there, and, and again, it's the same thing. Bitcoin's not changing. Bitcoin can't actually do all the other use cases. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's going to have to be new developments. And so we're, we're, we're in the and camp. You know, this has become a very, you know, this is, you know, this is, this is a full-fledged religious war at this point. So there are, um, you know, very strong believers with a great deal of kind of force and energy on, on all sides of this. And so there's definitely, you know, schisms on this, but we, you know, we're kind of a big tent kind of thing. And we're, we're, make, we're, we're making all the bets, we're including uh, Bitcoin. So, but, but you, you're betting that Bitcoin doesn't become the digital currency. You, the, you're distinguishing it as a store of value from it being a, an efficient and scalable digital dollar essentially. Yeah, so it can't, it can't in its current form, it can't. It, it can't be the digital dollar. It, it, the, the, it, the, the transaction processing system of Bitcoin, the way the blockchain works, it, it's not built for that level of scale and performance. Right. Yeah, and you, you can see that, by the way, because there's a cost associated with transactions. There's so-called mining fees. And you know, the cost to clear a transaction through Bitcoin is, is not, I don't know what it is today, but it's, it's non-trivial. And, so, and, and, and then there's long delays. And so we just like, it's just not going to be able to do that. And that's today, right? If, if, it, if it actually takes on, you know, a, a, you know even a, like a quarter of the global economy, it's going to be many, you know, orders of magnitude bigger than it is today. And it's, it's not going to be able to handle it. So, so this is the, this is the downside of Satoshi no longer being with us is like, it's, it's not adapting to be able to, like on earth two, Satoshi stayed involved hmm. and Bitcoin became everything, but like, that's, that's not, that's not what's happening on earth one. Now, Look, having said that, there are smart entrepreneurs that are developing layers on top of Bitcoin where they're going to try to like make that happen. You know, Jack Dorsey is a smart guy, has a whole effort to try to like have layers on top of Bitcoin to do this kind of thing. There are other people trying to do it. So there are people trying to kind of augment Bitcoin and kind of turbocharge it in different ways. Maybe some of those efforts will work or maybe it will just be brand new systems. There's also, by the way, a big transition, a big technology transition underway. You know, a, you know the, the original way Bitcoin worked was so-called proof of work where you solve all these math problems, um, right. you know, to sort of validate that you own what you own as uh, so the way the underlying transaction processing engine works. There's sort of an overall architecture change being kind of proposed in the industry, which is to what's called proof of stake, which is a sort of a much less energy, you know, sort of aggressive thing. And, and so if, if, and if, 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 if Ethereum is switching from, from proof of work to proof, proof of stake. And so if proof of stake works, like it's, it's one of these phase shifts that happens in the industry where just things work differently on the other side. Bitcoin would remain proof of work because it, it kind of mm -hmm. can't change, but, but you'll, you may have these new systems that just fundamentally work both different and much better for like high scale transaction processing. Now that, that's a, that's a, you know, that's a TBD, but like we're, we're pretty confident that that has a good chance of succeeding. So I guess, I, so now I want to kind of pivot to 
if not politics, uh, you know, politics adjacent, you know, larger societal concerns, you know, where we are at this moment in history, how technology is coming to the rescue or failing to come to the rescue. Uh, and I guess I, I, as a starting point to this chapter in the conversation, I would reference the essay you wrote early in COVID titled, It's Time to Build, um, which was really this, uh, you know, the, the, the technologists and entrepreneurs and, and in your case, uh, VC's heart cry for, you know, o- over just the misspent energy of the moment and just how much, how we should, I mean, so many of us at the time were feeling that we really needed to seize this opportunity to shore up our, our society against, you know, the forces of fragmentation. And it really was an opportunity to get our heads straight. And I, I don't know how you feel about this, but I think I, you know, looking back on it, I mean, obviously we're still in COVID land to some degree, but I look back on it as a kind of failed dress rehearsal for something much worse. I mean, I think that I think there will be things that are that are much worse, and I'm not drawing the comforting lesson that I wish I could draw from our performance the, over these last couple of years. That we've learned many lessons, even if we've made some obvious mistakes. We understand what those mistakes were, and we're not going to make those mistakes again. I, I just feel like we're we're all waking up from a bad dream, and in in the waking state, some of the the horrible creatures of the dream are still with us, and that we're we're not all that much wiser. Take me back to the moment you wrote that essay, and, and give me your your view of the last couple of years. What did COVID do to us? Yeah, so th- that essay was a primal scream. <laughs> I think it probably comes across that way, and I yeah. kind of say that in the essay. So, so it was it was at a very specific moment. It was when the you know COVID was hitting in New York City, um, and you know we all thought you know we all thought COVID was going to hit as hard everywhere. It, fortunately, it, it didn't. But like you know, in, in retrospect, like there were specific moments, like the it, you know Italy was a catastrophe, and then um, and then uh, you know New York City was a catastrophe. There were some others, but it, you know it, it fortunately it didn't actually hit the rest of the country the way it hit New York. But at that moment, it seemed like we were all really in for it. Yeah. To the degree to which New York was in for it at that time, which was, you know, very catastrophic for people in New York at that moment. You know, those were the days of just like constant wailing, you know, ambulance, you know, sounds everywhere in New York. And so the mayor of New York, the, 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 the sense departed Bill de Blasio, uh, put out a call and said, you know, if people with rain ponchos could please donate them to local hospitals for use of surgical gowns. Yes, that inspires confidence in our civilization. Uh, it was just like, Gee, you know, I, I, by the way, is this a family podcast or can I swear? You, you swear to your heart's content. Jesus, you know, I'll just, I'll just give the light. But Jesus f- Christ, like, like, really, like, you know, the civilization of the United States of America, 240 years in or whatever, literally, like, we're do- using rain ponchos for surgical gowns in hospitals in New York City. Honestly, like, that's where we've gotten to. You know, we don't, you know, we don't have masks. We don't have this. We don't have that. And, and now we, we don't have freaking surgical gowns. So it's like, this is just ridiculous. And so that, 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 that sort of, and, and, then, and then, you know, what, what I try to do with the essay is I kind of say, If you'd like to continue listening to this conversation, you'll need to subscribe at samharris.org. Once you do, you'll get access to all full-length episodes of the Making Sense podcast, along with other subscriber-only content, including bonus episodes and AMAs and the conversations I've been having on the Waking Up app. The Making Sense podcast is ad-free and relies entirely on listener support, and you can subscribe now at samharris.org.